Dit programma wordt mede mogelijk gemaakt door het International Film Festival Rotterdam. Welkom bij Big Talk. Tien dagen lang is Rotterdam helemaal filmgek. In het oude Luxor praat vanavond Hans Maarten van den Brink met de Deense regisseur Christopher Bo over de film Spies en Glistrup. Mijn dame en heer, we zijn nu in de reisbranche met een vlug. We zijn nu in de reisbranche met een We zijn nu in de reisbranche Spies en glad. Ja, spies reis en weer glad. Dat mag je zeggen. Spies reizen met glad. Ja, nu zit ik ringen te extra plaats, dus kom hier niet straks. Als je ziet ze hem, ja, du trots hem met spies, hij heeft weer sky heen doen. Nee, 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 mijn nieuwe morgen bij de dag. Hoera! Hi. Hi, hi. Hallo. Hallo. Thanks for being here. I need my belly button to hit this spot. Yeah, so yeah. That's not very important for these people, but no, for but the, uh, the millions of uh, people who are watching us on their television screen. Welcome. Um, we're going to um, to see your uh, um, um, movie, uh, Spies and Blister, Sex, Drugs and Taxation. Uh, of those three, most people would like to skip one, and it's not the sex. Um, I, I would like to, to start with a confession. I watched your film without reading anything beforehand. No documentation, nothing on the background. I thought, I'll do, I'll do that later. Yes. So I was watching this and I thought, this is what in English is called a romp. It's, it's storytelling getting out of hand. It's, it's, a fa it's farcical. It's, you don't believe that this, all this really happened. Um, it's, it's over the top. And then towards the end, I saw the newspaper clips and I thought, wait a minute. This is not fiction. This is a reenactment of history. And that's what it is. All this, what we are going to see, an, an, an episode in the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, in your home country, Denmark, has really happened. And you've recreated it for a film. Almost really happened. Almost really happened. I'm, I'm going to ask you later what you added and what you, uh, what you took away from it, but it's about finance. It's about sex, it's about taxes, it's about politics. Did you want to make a political statement with this film? Um, in, in, in that case, it's... it's <coughs> can you hear me? <laughs> um, I think it's... it's uh, I'm not sure what the statement is. But I, I think that the, I, I wanted to do a movie with people, about people, who has a very different political agenda than the one we're used to right now. I know that a lot of people can say, well, there's a lot of things happening with the Tea Party and radical right-wing uh, parties and populist movement coming up. But what's intriguing about these two guys is the fact that this, it turns into a party, but it, turn, it, it, it all begins with this two, these two strange guys just saying, fuck off to the government. And, I just, I, I feel and we want to make money. And we, and we want to make money. That's, uh, that's an important note. Because, and that's sort of a counter story to what we've usually been told about the 60s. The 60s, about, about the, liber the, the, the strive for liberty, is very connected with the hippies, right? The hippie values of sexual freedom mm -hmm. and, and saying no to the government, but, but yes to a community and, and, and more left-wing <laughs> ideologies. So I just think it's interesting that you have these two bald old guys having a lot of hippie values in the sense that they want openness, they want sexual freedom, they want to take drugs, they want to do all kinds of funny things, but they also want to make money and they want the government to leave them alone. And uh, at least in Denmark, I thought, we, we need to also have that story. Okay, we, we're not going to give away the story, but just to make it a little more, bit more intelligible for the audience. Um, Spies and Glister are, are two guys. One is a, is a businessman who turns into a sort of guru uh, he's in the travel business, and and Glistrup is a is a is a genius tax lawyer, and his 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 ideal is his anarchistic ideal is no taxes, nobody t pays taxes, and it's the story of these of these two men. And as you say, it's a sort of strange mixture of hedonism and anarchy and politics. Was that what attracted you? Is that what you're saying? Uh, it attracted me that they are they are hard to define. 
and, uh, and the fact that my parents always hated them. So when I was a kid, so my, pa my parents are very, uh, very, what do you call that? Um, Politically correct. You could call them that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so these were just, it was ob obvious to me in my home that these were just bad company and off limits and you shouldn't touch them and you shouldn't associate yourself with them. But at the same time, in the public and my parents, there was a lot of respect for them because one of them was a brilliant businessman. I mean... They were both brilliant in, in their... In the respective field, they were very brilliant and there was a lot of respect for them. So they were at the same time idiots. Everybody hate, a lot of people hated them. My parents hated them. But at the same time, you couldn't not respect them within their fields because they were brilliant in some ways. And I just I felt very attracted to this. How come you can be brilliant and an idiot at the same time? Hmm. Um, so it, it, so th there is, it is about politics, but what attracted you was the personalities. Yeah. And maybe also the fun of <coughs> making a, a, a film which has 60s, 70s and 80s. Uh, I'm a married man with three kids. Uh, the only way I can get uh, to see naked people, actresses, naked is, actresses yeah, of course, is yeah. filming them. So <laughs> that's my excuse. What's yours? Hmm, I, was, I was thinking, <laughs> I'm not a director. I'm sitting here with a, with a married man with three children and a beard. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. Um, no, but it's, I mean, it's also, and that's a, a joy for everybody who's lived through the period, you know, the dresses, the cars, the, 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 the whole entourage. That must be great fun for a filmmaker. It, it was, and it would have been if we had more money. Uh, but the thing is, when we, we didn't have a lot of money, so not to sit here and complain, but uh, making a historical movie, everything just becomes a situation that you have to deal with. People can't just walk in from the street. I've, I've always loved to mix real life and, and fiction, so often I've taken my actors and put them out in real situations. I just used a, a corner in a cafe. Suddenly, you can't do that. Anybody who's in the frame needs to have the kind of right kind of wardrobe, needs to have his hair in the right direction. I couldn't be in the shot because nobody would look my, like me, bald and stuff like that. There was so, boldness in the 60s. Yeah, but you would have long hair and you would comb it over and... Uh, oh, but that's wonderful. <laughs> And stuff like that. It just, yeah. everything was uh, a situation. Um, but, we, but we tried to deal with that. And, uh, and we tried to figure out ways so it still became like a big movie in the sense I, I very much wanted this to have a sort of a dynamic feel to it. That it didn't feel like a stale, low-budget movie, but that you hopefully don't think about the money, but there is a, a, a good drive to the story and to the momentum of the scenes. So... So how did you develop the story? I mean, there were all the historical facts, biographical stuff yeah. about these real existing characters. Did you start by creating your own storyline or just following all the episodes? So at the very beginning, I, I knew basically where I wanted it to end. There is this dramatic ending, which you... We, you we will not tell. We will not tell, but <laughs> anyhow, there, one of the characters begins a party and there is this, uh, this, the, the election. So basically mm. the first election that he goes to with his new party, I wanted to end it there. But, but from there, there could, it could be going many directions. So it was basically research, talking with people they took drugs with, slept with, had politics with, discussions with, talked with families and stuff like that. And then having you all... actually th interviewed the, the, the yes. real... I, I, I we talked with a lot of people and had actually two um, journalists on assigned to this uh, at the beginning that made timelines and, and went back to the material of uh, newspapers and uh, source material to figure out what was actually being said and done at the, during this period. And then the, there's also, of course, the, 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 apart from the, the, the whole set dressing, the, the, the physical aspect of the two characters. They're well known, I guess, still in, in, uh, yeah. in, in Denmark, so you if you want it to be real life, they should look like the yeah. real characters. And they do. Yeah. I saw the photographs. They do. H how long did you, did you rehearse with them? How, how did you get them we, we to come I so mean, close to reality? There's, there's uh, like two main uh, situations with that. One is the, the accent. They talk in a very distinct way. If you know Danish, you would definitely, uh, as, as soon as Moan says something, you know it's Moan. So he has a very distinct voice in the same with speech. So we have these two so this, this, this high-pitched, irritating yeah. speech voice is not like what all Danes speak. N it's not just the actor no, no, playing okay. funny, no. Okay, no. I told him to do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's one other thing. They needed to talk like these two characters, and then they had to look like them. They also looked very distinctive. So we actually obviously had a lot of makeup tests and how much should we actually 
do with uh, hair and makeup and stuff like that. So in the end, we, we, we try to find a very toned down so it doesn't become all about hair and makeup. But um, there, there's but a process. But it's also very much about movement, yes. especially in the case of Glistrup. You, you say, whoa. Did this take endless rehearsals, and, and did, did they study? I cast uh, a great actor who was already fat. That, mm, that yeah. helped a lot. No, no method acting, no Robert De Niro stuff no. in this. No, and most, uh, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, Nicholas Brule is one of the greatest actors in Denmark, and I've, I've worked with him in always. So I basically, as soon as I knew I wanted to make this movie, I called him up and said, you sh I have my next movie. And he's always been a little irritated with me because I made sort of more straight movies where I cast, would he say, very classic, beautiful people, and then yeah. I made some sort of rough documentary, and then I cast him. And, and he was he's a little not pissed a classic, handsome leading Why man, am no, I not no. your lead actor in one of the big scope movies? And I said, I have a big scope movie. Now, it's, it's widescreen, and we have a big budget. You're playing and the you lead. And you can be a big man. But yeah. you're playing most glistrop. And it became very silent at the other end of the phone. <laughs> uh, most Glistrop is the most hated man between in, in, in the film industry and in, in anywhere in Denmark. He's like Why in the film industry? The film industry is classically, you know, left wing, left, okay, yeah. cultural, mm -hmm. radical. So mm -hmm. I mean most Glistrop is just he's he's the worst kind of person you can touch. He's like kryptonite for <laughs> Superman mm -hmm. if you are mm -hmm. a Danish it's, yeah. Superman. Yeah. Superman. Yeah. Or, or just uh, ordinary working in the in the, in the cultural little uh, business. Anyhow, I told him to do this. So long silence. Long silence. He accepted, and then it took me three years to finish the script. So we had a long time to. Uh, you to had practice. too much inspiration or too much information. It, it, it turned out it was a little more difficult than I thought. Actually, writing based on real events, yeah. because uh, as mentioned in the, in the beginning of the movie. It's true and it's not true, but I wanted the essence of this to be very truthful. So the, the characters and the portrayal of the characters, to me, is very truthful. And finding that right balance between having events that you obviously need to invent, you need to manipulate them to work in the movie and to make them say what you wanted to say, but respect the truthfulness of what I mm -hmm. perceive to be most Glistro and Simus Bees just turned out to be really difficult. Yeah. I, I was wondering, um, these guys, so, excuse me, are two jerks. Um, idiots. I, could you sort of love them as a director also, the characters? I love them. You yes. do? Yeah? <laughs> I, think they're, I think they're great. I think obviously they have... I'm they not have talking about the actors, I'm talking no, about no, the I, characters. I, I understand, I understand, yeah. I understand. Whoa. I, I, I spent so many years with those. I, I wouldn't do it if I just thought they were idiots. I, I, this is not an intriguing portrayal of people I think we should just dislike. There is something very interesting about people who goes against the norm who mm -hmm. does something unexpected, who does something almost uh, suicidal, but does it with conviction and does it in some ways with brilliance and charm. I think it's very intriguing and I think it, 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 it to, what makes... To, it's very intriguing to, to a father of three who... Is, yeah? <laughs> also that, also yeah. that. But basically I think it's very important that we have these originals and originals are something that also cost it's, it's, it, it's a fantasy to, th to think you can uh, have these wonderful persons who go against the grain, and it's without cost. Obviously, being associated or dealing with people who are idealistic or, or really outside the norm, it takes a toll on everybody, and I think you should accept that. But I think it's worth the price. Okay. Um, you just mentioned um, the, the, the tension between your scenario and, and historical facts. That is always a problem if you... If you um, if you, uh, because film being such a, a powerful uh, um, a medium, um, a lot of people, I guess, in the United States think that the, the Kennedy murder was solved by Robert Stone, because it's in the movie and they've seen it. Um, didn't you have a problem with that? That sort of everybody in Denmark knew what really happened and, 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 and where, where did you divert? Uh... Did they have a problem with the fact that people already have a preconception of how these people were? No, that, that you're dealing with real historical facts, so you have a very limited liberty, but also responsibility, because people are going to think, well, I've seen the movie, I know wh how it was. If you see the movie, you know you don't know how it was, because that's what I state. And obviously the movie has this sense that, yes, you get the sense of their lives, but what really happened, who know? This is tw almost 20 years of life condensed into 90 minutes. I mean. 
who, who's fooling who? These are two actors reciting my, my lines. This is mm -hmm. not real life, but I researched it enough and I have an opinion about these two guys that hopefully you go, you go out, you have a sense of who, they were, who these guys were, and you have an ungefähr feeling of the main events of their lives. And those are actually true, even though they look and outrageous. And the no, other no. thing is that people have a preconception of how things are in real mm -hmm. life. They have a historical sense of, well, what happened? Well, the th wonderful thing uh, in reality is that often that preconception is wrong, yeah. or they don't know enough. So when you have a movie, they suddenly find out, wow, there were things to the story I didn't know. So, so I think I, I so what, what, did, what did you invent? What should we look for? Like, hey, this is not. When every this is, this every time those two guys are in a room and there's nobody else, who's to say what's been said? Okay, yeah, that's a that's an important clue. Uh, how was the film received in Denmark? Uh, uh, surprisingly well. How's that? <laughs> Two such controversial figures, and it turns out you love them? Well, wh one being Kryptonite and the other being a Nazi, uh, you <laughs> would imagine uh, that uh, people would have objections of, uh, with a movie that says these guys are actually quite fun. Uh, it, it turned out, obviously, there are people who actually said, and it's, it were, there were political, in, in my experience, it was the first, in the sense that there were definitely reviews that said, we like the movie, we hate the guys, we can't accept this kind of movie. Because you hate the guys, you cannot accept the movie. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, but mostly, it, w it was very well received, and the, and the audience liked it a lot, which is definitely new for me. Your former films were not... I appreciate it, but, but I mean, I have had movies that the entire scope of the movie's lifespan couldn't even fill this cinema, so... I, I, I come from a place where I've been very intrigued by small elements of, of cinema history and the telling of, of genres and reinventing genres. And, and I just realized that that taste is not... I don't share it with a lot of people. Okay. But, but, uh, but, but now you have a theme and a story that, that you can share. It, it shows I, I enjoyed the movie thoroughly. Just one last theme I would like to, to touch upon. Um, this festival has an... Uh, has a one of the themes is, is Europe. Um, where do we stand uh, politically also? Um, the um, the, the pro progressive party that um, um, starts in, in your story is still uh, alive and in parliament. It has a different name now. It, it is called the, uh, Danish, the Danish Populist Party. Yeah, and it's... It, it's, it's a, I mean, basically there's a breakout. He, uh, it's, it's part of the... It's the daughter, it's the bastard child of the yeah. Progressive Party. Well, we yeah. had something similar here. Um, the, the famous Rotterdamer Pim Fortuyn and, and now Geert Wilders, who's in a league with your uh, successor to the Pro Progressive Party of yeah. the movie. Um, is it, is I started with politics, I would like to end there. Is it, is it also a sort of message about how people can be manipulated? Um, and, and, and was it picked up like that in Denmark? Uh, I think it's a different story in Denmark because he was very known in the last couple of years. He became very anti-immigration. And this movie is, has nothing to do about that. We don't, I'm not trying to shove it under the carpet. I'm not trying to sugarcoat his story. Obviously, that was a big part of his legacy, all this kind of uh, anti-immigration. I have no interest in that kind of politics. I think it's appalling. And uh, the movie, and there's a very good reason, I think, for why he began that kind of politics, because he was in jail, he was beaten yeah. up, he was, he was basically, he was just a broken man. But the movie is all about trying to look at when he started up, what, what kind of man was he and what was his ideas, and I think that, that became the political debate in Denmark, because that's not something that we looked upon for almost 30 years. We, we only looked upon his last anti-immigration years, uh, which has all kinds of... I th but I, th I think we see, see that all over Europe, that uh, protest parties sort of turn into a sort of Tea Party populist, um, left-leaning politics when it comes to social security, etc., et and, and the one unifying thing, anti-immigration, yeah. anti-Islam. Same thing happened in, in Denmark. Yeah. Okay. Well, your film doesn't touch on that, but we see a, a great story leading up to that uh, in a certain way. You're in for a ride, ladies and gentlemen. Um, enjoy the film, and thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you for coming. The next film that you so gaat zien, comes from Argentinië and heet Una Semana Solos van Selina Murga. 
Het gaat over een groepje rijke luiskinderen uit een dure wijk van Buenos Aires... ...die een week alleen worden gelaten door hun drukke ouders. Dit programma werd mede mogelijk gemaakt door het International Film Festival Rotterdam.